see if in today's session i think uh, in the morning you people have been introduced uh, so today that is this on this day you are introduced to introduction to neural network right so what we will do we will try to continue with the, uh, that particular topic and we will try to focus on deep learning today in this case i will first of all try to explain you the basic things which you are going to need the code and the implementation which i am going to show you right and uh, then i will be explaining you each and everything about the code and <clears throat> yes uh, whatever what are the documents i am going to make you of whatever the code i am going to make you of i will be sharing with the uh, madam and ultimately you can get it okay so this is this is what we are going to see now that is the deep learning so as usual uh, let me first of all tell you about today's agenda let me create space here so i hope everybody is able to see this black screen right just a minute mm, yeah let me tell you the agenda what are the points which we are going to discuss today so so that everyone should get an idea and you will be prepared for that or uh, whatever the things which you are going to require for understanding the concepts right so here also what i will do i will try to come up with some and some things and, and I, i will try to show you some models how to create the deep learning models right and how to make use of those deep learning models that's what we will <coughs> try to see here so if you remember in yesterday session right in, in the yesterday afternoon session we talked about uh, the concepts like artificial intelligence uh, i have given you a very short introduction about all this right ai dl machine learning and data science and our topic uh, yesterday was machine learning so there we talked about some two uh, one or two uh, one project actually uh, one application we we talked about that one right <clears throat> today what we will do uh, yeah that, that that's what we have seen and also we talked about some of the approaches of machine learning so why am i writing down it here because i, I just want to let you know where are all these things going to be used in deep learning so i will just try to correlate the things whatever we have learned in the last session to the today's session in today's session right so that's what we have seen here if you remember we talked about for the supervised learning and supervised learning semi supervised learning and the important stuff and there were some algorithms which i have actually pointed out yesterday and we implemented one of them after that now what we will do today is i will give you an introduction about some of the packages some of the frameworks which we are going to make use of here for for uh, creating the models in deep learning so i will talk about tensor flow so what is tensor flow how to install it and how to make use of the tensor flow <clears throat> then it's not like that there is only tensor flow in deep learning there are other things also for example some of you might have heard about something called as <coughs> pytorch I will talk about this. What is Pytorch? When to make use of Pytorch? When to make use of TensorFlow? And what's the difference between them? So many of you might have heard about TensorFlow and Pytorch. But again, there are other frameworks which can be used for uh, deep learning. One another one is called as DL Core. So we will see what is DL Core. There is something called as CNO. This is also something important. And obviously, Keras. We are going to talk about. I will tell you uh, how to make use of the Keras. And one more framework is there that is Keras. all this uh, all these things whatever i am trying to lay down here all these things are actually used in deep learning whenever you want to create a model in deep learning one can make use of all these so for this session i will be showing you the implementation of the models with the help of tensorflow right tensorflow and keras i can but yes i will be giving you the idea about other frameworks so at least an introduction about all these other frameworks like pytorch dl core what all these things we will try to see that so once that is done uh Fourth point, I will start with the concept of deep learning in detail. So we will see in the in detail as today's topic is deep learning itself. So we will see what is deep learning and uh, where it can be used, and we will see uh, uh, what are the points or what are the concepts one should be aware about to understand the concept of a deep learning. After that, here we will try to talk about uh, the types or the approaches for. implementing the different models in deep learning for example here we will try to see uh, what is ann artificial neural network then we will try to talk about what is convolutional neural network and then one more is there that is recurrent neural network that is rnn these are the concepts i will be talking about and in, i am i am going to show you the implementation of these two at least uh, some of the examples we will try to see and we will implement it so that everyone should be able to get a clear idea about all this so uh artificial neural network convolutional neural network and recurrent neural network and we will see where they can be uh, used okay after that i will go and i will try to discuss about some of the concepts which you are going to require like what we mean by neuron right what is the meaning of uh, activation function why it is used so uh, 
uh, in the discussion only we are going to uh, we are going to come across all these terms what do you mean by gradient descent so yesterday if you remember i already talked about this particular term at right, in machine learning uh, session so what do you mean by gradient descent optimizer and how to make use of gradient descent optimizer in case of deep learning that we will try to talk about and obviously there is one more term which we are going to need to understand the deep learning model and that is nothing but back back propagation so i'll be i'll be explaining you all these things step by step right <clears throat> with with example with proper example and then for implementation i am going to implement artificial neural network okay so we will create a simple uh, neural network uh in which we will be making use of uh, ann so we will implement ann in python right we are we are going to make use of tensor flow tensor flow and uh, kera seconds after this i will try to show a very small example one more example which is again going to be the implementation and uh, we are going to implement one more example for artificial neural network only and that that is going to make use of medical data. so here what we will do we will try to create such a deep learning model which is going to help us to identify whether the patient is affected by cancer or not so i'll be showing you the data set i'll be uh, sharing the links of all the data sets which i will be making you know here okay so uh, what i had done is i actually created a text file in that text file i have uh, i have actually included all the links for all the data sets which i am going to show you here so implementation of nn again in python for medical data and that is on structured data which we are going to make use of after that here after that i will go and i will try to implement a more neural network that is convolutional neural network and this we will be doing for image data so i will show you how to train your model with the help of image data and that image data will be of uh, you might have come across this particular example dogs and cats i will show you the data set right now only okay so If if I want to show this particular data set, uh, dog and cat, let me just show you that particular data set. Data set. So see, uh, there is a separate folder actually. What I created is this particular data set. You will be using in one of our convolutional neural networks. So cat dog folder. In that, you will be able to see this kind of a data set. So I will show you how to train a model based on this image data. <laughs> Because most of the times I have seen many people those who are going for PhDs, they have. Uh, So they actually come across image kind of a data set. So we will try to see. So you can see all these are the images of the cats. So we will see how to convert these images into numbers or uh, how to store them in arrays, and then how to train the model based on this. Right. So here, uh, what I have is I have two folders. One is for dog and one is for cat. Right. So we will be making use of this particular data as a training data, and then we will try to uh, train the model. so what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning model while uh, once you get a final output that that we will try to talk about so here you can see this is a this is the data for the dogs right so this is what i am going to make use of to create a model to which once it is created and if you pass any image so if you pass any image of a dog or a cat our model will be able to identify whether it's a dog or a cat for example i i can go to the uh, i can go and download some image from the internet Uh, any random image, and our model will be able to identify whether it's a dog or a cat. That's what we are going to see, right? So we will see that that particular model. So that was my point. I was talking about. That's what uh, the data set I have shown, dog cat example. And the last point, if we get time, I will show you one more model with implementation. That will be for convolutional neural net, and this will be for COVID-19 data, right? So. Uh, as as this is as according to the current situation you might be knowing right <clears throat> so what happens is here we have x ray images on the basis of those x ray images we will try to create a convolutional neural network which is going to help us to identify whether the patient is positive or negative so uh, you might be knowing that pneumonia is uh, the first stage right or many uh, doctors even they are if they detect pneumonia right they ask patients to to, to take rest or on the x ray images only uh, uh, many times uh, doctor actually this those x ray images actually helps doctor to to know whether the patient is affected by pneumonia or not and then uh, by following some parameters by, by with the help of some parameters they come to the conclusion that okay patient is affected by covid you know or not so what what i have did let me show you this particular data set also here it is so in the same folder uh, here you will find out the data set for uh, That particular model. If I go here, 
Now see, this is the COVID-19 data set. Here I have divided into training and validation. If I go to training data, here you will be able to find out the data of the patients who are affected by COVID that is positive and the data of the patients that is normal that is negative who are not affected by COVID-19. So if I go and if I try to show you this particular data set, it's again image data, right? So if, if uh, you want to see that, again, it's a huge data actually. This model will require some time to train. Uh, I will be showing you that. Okay. That will be our uh, last model if we get time. Now see, this is this is the data of the patients who, who are affected by or who are or positive, or positive, right? This is what we are. So what we will do, what we will do is we will take help of this data to train our model so that if new data comes, our model will be able to identify whether that particular person is affected by COVID-19 or not, or positive or negative, right? That's what it is going to do. And this data set which you are able to see now, this is the data set of the, of the patients or of the people who, who are negative, who are not affected by uh, COVID-19, right? You can see that, right? So I'll be making use of this and I'll be trying to train the model. As you have uh, already seen that we have divided this particular data into training and validation. So either you call it as training testing or training validation is, is one and the same thing. So, so yeah, this is the data set. This is the data set of the people who are uh, negative, okay, or who are normal, not affected by COVID. So yes, this is what I'm going to make use of. Let me come to the agenda once again. So you can see, I will show you the points once again. So you can see these are the points I am trying to cover today. In whatever the time we have, we will try to cover all those things one by one. Right. So these points we have already discussed. I will be starting directly with this one because I am, I am, I am expecting that now you are aware about the concepts of artificial intelligence an idea about deep learning, machine learning you already seen, data science and difference between them and supervised learning, unsupervised, semi-supervised and reinforcement. These concepts we have seen. Okay. Now, what I'll be doing is, uh, as we are going to require, suppose let me create a Word document here. So whatever uh, I'm going to write down here, I'm going to store that in a Word document so that uh, if you people require all these things later on, you don't have to even go to the video, just go to the document. Right? I will be I will be maintaining all those things here. Let me create a document, Word document here. Let me take a screenshot of that. Okay, so like this, I will be maintaining each and every time. So, uh, let me clear and let me start with this one, TensorFlow, PyTorch, dl 4 what are all these things? Uh, let, let's try to talk about them one by one, okay? So, let me clear all these things. Let's first of all talk about TensorFlow, what are these? So, TensorFlow, as I told you, it's a framework which is available in uh, for, for deep learning actually. Actually, there are different versions, so there are different, different frameworks. I am going to start with uh, TensorFlow. I will show you how to install it. Okay. <clears throat> so there is a version like TensorFlow 1.x, right? The installation of TensorFlow 1. Point version is uh, it's easy installation actually. It is not going to take a lot of time. But in case of TensorFlow 1. Point, uh, version 1.x versions, we have something called as session, right? And uh, it is actually nothing but a package of uh, resources which are required right or i can say session is an instance right uh, which allocates uh, cpu and gpu okay so and there are different types of placeholders which are available for tensor okay placeholder or variables i can say so in case of uh, uh, tensorflow version 1.x if you if i want to differentiate between 1.x and 2.x there is a difference between both these versions in case of TensorFlow version 1.x, there was no dynamic memory allocation, right? So I hope you understand this. Dynamic memory allocation was not available in case of TensorFlow 1. It was not there. But in case of TensorFlow 2, dynamic memory allocation is there. That's a basic difference between uh, TensorFlow 1.x and 2.x. And as I, as I said that there is something called as placeholder. Placeholder is something uh, where uh, data can be provided at runtime. So it, it can actually hold that particular uh, data set. And TensorFlow never does type casting kind of a thing itself, right? So <clears throat> as I said that there is not only TensorFlow, there are other frameworks also which are available in uh, for uh, deep learning. We will try to see those things also. 
and basically talking about the tensor flow tensor flow is actually uh, developed by google okay? and uh, uh, the companies different companies also make use of uh, tensor flow okay? so we will see we will see the installation of it next type of framework which i have written in the agenda it was something like a dl4j now dl4j actually stands for uh, deep learning for java So DL4J is also a framework which can be used uh, in deep learning. So it is deep learning for Java. But this particular framework is not widely used. Right? That's why many of you might not have heard about it. There is a framework which is called as Tiano. Tiano is also a framework. I can say uh, before TensorFlow, this one was there. Right? So uh, Tiano is actually the, the predecessor, you can say, for TensorFlow. And now there is a more important framework which is called as Pytorch. Many of you might have heard about Pytorch, or we call it as Torch. So what is this? So Pytorch is actually an in-house uh, framework which is uh, which is developed by Facebook, and it is used by Facebook and Twitter-like companies. So Twitter and Facebook make use of Pytorch, and it contains some uh, predefined models. This. Uh, Pytorch contains predefined models which can be used. Okay, and yes, uh, that's what I have I think written. And yeah, there is one more that is called as there is one more framework that is called as Cafe. So Cafe is actually a framework which is based in Python C++ language. It is C++ based, right? So TensorFlow, DL4j, Tiano, Pytorch, Cafe. These are the models which are available for deep learning here. In today's session, I will be showing you the use of TensorFlow for uh, creating the model. And uh, yeah, obviously there is something called as Keras. Now let me tell you what is Keras actually. Keras is a uh, high-level library which is available for uh, TensorFlow, right? And and it is by default available in TensorFlow. You don't have to install uh, Keras separately, right? It's it's a high-level library which is available for Uh, TensorFlow. So, and in case of Pytorch, uh, Pytorch actually, uh, it it is inbuilt. Uh, it, it is it is available as a inbuilt. So you don't have to worry about that. So in short, what happens is you might be knowing about the libraries which we have used in machine learning. For example, so in machine learning, <clears throat> we have used the libraries like Matplotlib. Matplotlib package we have used. There is something called as Coplink. Right, Coplink is also there. These are the libraries which are available in for machine learning. Right. So similarly, in deep learning on a similar end, there is something called as tensor space or tensor flow, or or I can call it as tensor flow graph or tensor graph. Right. So what? Why do we use these things in machine learning for plotting the graphs? So similarly, in deep learning, we use this for plotting for doing the same. Right. So uh, that is all in short about. All this framework, which one can make use of in uh, deep learning. So what we will do now is uh, one by one we will try to uh, see. And uh, as I told you that I'll be showing you some models. So the models will be shown with the help of TensorFlow. So the next thing I am going to do is installation of TensorFlow. Okay, so let me just clear this. Okay, and I see uh, what I am doing here in Word document is I am trying to maintain functionality. Screenshot. Whatever, whatever I am trying to discuss here, I am just trying to maintain that. So now, what are we going to need? So as I told you in the agenda, if you see here in this agenda, if you see, I told you that we will be discussing about deep learning and we will be discussing about types of uh, deep learning: artificial neural network, convolutional neural network, and recurrent neural network. But for implementing all these things, what are we going to require? Is we are going to require some tools. For example, TensorFlow, we are going to require. That's what I'm going to install. So the next thing I'm going to do is installation of TensorFlow and Keras. Why am I discussing it? Because many times I have seen that people uh, get a lot of problems in installation. You will not get the problems if you follow a proper version, right? A suitable version which is required for TensorFlow. Let me tell you how. See, in my case, let me first of all tell you, I am using Anaconda's Python, right? So here, uh, I am going to make use of Anaconda's Python. So what happens is uh, you people also might be using this one, okay? So there is Anaconda prompt available. I will open Anaconda prompt. 
based on this particular thing. Okay. Now, as and when I open Anaconda prompt, what you are able to see is something called as base. So, can anyone tell me what is this base? Maybe in your previous sessions you might have come across this. Thing. Can can anyone any idea about this? What is this base? What is it called as? This is in Anaconda, okay? Or maybe those who are using Python, they might be knowing about this. So, anyone any idea? Can you just let me know? All the participants, uh, what is this base? Whatever I am highlighting here, this one. Any idea about it? Anyone? <coughs> Yes. Or any guesses about this? What to what do you mean by this base? Why the name is like that? Or what it is called as? No? Okay. So see, this what what is this base is? This base is called as environment. If you remember yesterday in afternoon session, I have shown you one model, right? In that model, I uh, when we discussed uh, the application, wave application, right? In that, yes, it's an anaconda root shell. Okay, so it is called as uh, uh, Mr. Ranjit Singh Sura, right? Yeah, it's an anaconda root shell, and it is called as environment. So, if you remember when we discussed uh, that wave application yesterday, so in PyCharm I told you how to create the environment. Now see, what's environment? Environment is like, uh, it, it is something where we have everything which is required for a particular project or a particular uh, work or whatever you are doing for a particular module. So for example, if you are developing some project, uh, maybe uh, related to some uh, domain in which you have image data. So whatever the packages which you are required for developing that particular module or project, all those packages will be installed in that environment. So generally what happens in real time is, for a separate project, we have separate environment, right? So this is nothing but environment. And why the name is based? By default, in Anaconda's Python, the name of the environment, by default, it is based. But we are not going to make use of this base environment in our case, right? So what happens is, uh, as, as we are going to require TensorFlow, so, so suppose, see, if I want to implement artificial neural network, I am going to require TensorFlow, right? But here, see, let me show you. Uh, before your session, I was just trying all those things. Let me uh, let me close this Anaconda's uh, prompt. Let me go back. Okay. I have already opened this one. Let me close this folder. <laughs> let me close Anaconda's prompt. So that you people will get what is that Anaconda. Now, see, as I said, this one. Okay. So see, as I'm highlighting this Anaconda's uh, base environment, by default, by default it is called as this. But that is not what we are going to make it. Now I am going to start Anaconda Navigator. Okay. Where, where my Jupyter notebook is. I will tell you why I close it. See, what happens? As this is the base environment, this is what we are going to make it. So what I will do is, as I am going to make use of TensorFlow, so I will be creating a new environment. And then I will install the TensorFlow. So, how to create the new environment? So, you can also follow all these steps if you want to create. So, see, the step is like this Conda create hyphen n. So, Conda create hyphen n. That means what name I want to give? Suppose I want to give the name as dpu underscore pa. Okay, TensorFlow, whatever name you want. And the version of the Python which I am going to make use of. So, see. The version of the Python which I want to make use of is, or which I, have, I know that which is going to work without any problem with uh, with TensorFlow is TensorFlow is Python 3.6.8, right? So I am going to create environment with the name dpu underscore tf. So now so create hyphen n dpu underscore tf. Python is equal to is equal to 3.6.8. I hope everyone is able to understand this. So dpu underscore tf is the user defined. Let me press enter. Once I press enter, so it is going to collect the package metadata, right? Now see what's going to happen is once your environment is created, this base name is going to change to this particular base name. Instead of this base name, you will be able to see dpu underscore tf because that's what our environment is. We do not want to make it of a default environment, right? 
and all the other packages which you are able to see here. Right. So let's wait for some time. It is going to complete that. Yes. Now see, it has it has actually done everything without any error. It did not show any error. Now how to confirm that everything is okay? So what you need to do is, if I go here and if I try to type Python, what should happen is it should take me to the Python prompt. Right. Let me see. Now see, it should take me to the Python prompt where I can go and I can type all the Python commands. Now see, here I am. Here I am on the Python prompt. Here I can go and I can actually run any code, any Python code which I want. Right. So for example, if I want to test whether TensorFlow is going to work here in this environment or not. So what I will do is I will try to run this with a simple command. Import TensorFlow. Now this should work. If it shows me error here, that means something is wrong. That means I need to go and I need to try it once again. Let me check import TensorFlow and press enter. It should work without any error. It should not show me any error. If it doesn't show any error, that means everything is okay. Right? Now see, in my case, it did not show any error. That means uh, I am on the correct path. So that's all. That is how you can go and you can install the uh, tensor. Now, what I can do is, so I will be making use of the environment which I have created for tensor. In my case, I already told you, I have already created the environment with the name uh, tf underscore ytm. That environment I am going to make use of. From here, how to exit? Just type exit here. Okay. So I will be in this particular environment. And now from this one, if you want to deactivate that particular environment, just type Honda and deactivate this one. So Honda deactivate. Now what should happen? Once I run this command, from this one, I should again come to the base environment. Now see, it was here. Now again, I, I come up, come to the base environment, right? So this is how one can go and one can actually install TensorFlow. That's all. These are the steps, five to six steps only there to install TensorFlow. Now let me show you what has happened here. So see, as I told you that by default, it is going to make use of the default environment. That is nothing but base. I will show you where is our environment. Name of the our environment. Name of our environment is what? DP underscore here. Let me go and click on this environment. Right? And let me show you, you will, you will be able to find out our environment here in the list of all these environment variables. So what was the name? So it was starting with DP. Okay, it, is, it is loading all those things. So here, here you will be able to find out the name of the name of our environment, which we created with the name DP underscore here. So yeah. you will be able to find out that name. Now see. If you are able to see, I will just highlight that name. You can check it here. DPU underscore here. This is the environment which we created. Right? So that means that environment was successfully created and that's why we are able to see. And in that environment, we already installed this so package. But as I told you, I will be using uh, the environment YTM underscore here. So YTM underscore YTM. Yeah, TF underscore YTM. This environment I was. I already created and I already installed all the necessary packages uh, in this environment so that it will save over time because otherwise what will happen when I will show you deep learning models in that I will have to install some of the packages and it will take some time. That's what I will do. I will use the earlier environment in which I have already installed all the necessary packages. So TF underscore YPM is the environment which I have created by following the same steps which I have just shown to you, right? So remember this is how you created uh, environment now see right now i am going i am making use of uh, which environment instead of base now it is the underscore okay that's what we want now i will go here and i will launch jupyter okay so this is what i wanted to tell you now if i go and if i try to see in the agenda so tensorflow uh, PyTorch Gen Project era. I have given you a basic idea about this. Now I will go and try to start with the concept of deep learning. So here, so once this, uh, yeah, once this Jupyter launches, so <clears throat> there is a separate folder for uh, whatever the things I am discussing here. So let me go to that folder and let me open the file. So there is a folder called as DLA which I am going to use for this one. So 
so let's let's start with the concept of uh, deep learning what is deep learning just try to understand that and then see uh, see the implementation one by one so see before before going to the concept of deep learning let's understand the simple difference between deep learning and machine learning as we have already seen uh, about machine learning let's let's have a discussion on these two things first what is the basic difference between these two see if if i want to discuss machine learning or if i want to discuss the difference between machine learning and deep learning in both in both of these uh, we can do something called as predictive model right yesterday we have already developed a predictive model if you are trying to predict the chance of admission of a participant for one user right so in both of these cases in ml as well as in dl one can go and one can uh, do predictive modeling as well as something called as forecasting right that is again same thing for predictive modeling and forecasting you can do with the help of machine learning and deep learning in ml specifically if we decide features so see for example if we have a data set right so here we have this these are the input features and for example this is our target feature right feature i mean to say what feature i mean to say uh, column or attribute so suppose these are our input columns this is our output column or target or a feature or dependent column what we do what i told you in machine learning we decide the feature which affect the output right that means human decide the features which is going to affect the output for example maybe if, if you are developing a model uh, which is going to predict the mass of a student right so that means there is human intervention in machine learning there is human intervention right but in deep learning it is not like that deep learning is like uh, in short if i want to tell you i can define deep learning like this making an artificial brain in short i can call deep learning as making an artificial brain that's it now just to make a sense out of this let me explain this as i told you in machine learning we as humans we decide the features which affect the output right so whatever the feature that affect for example if if we are developing a application which is in which we are going to predict the mass of a student so whatever the feature that affect the mass of a student those features will be decided by humans that's what happens in machine learning right but if you talk about deep learning here the features will be uh, selected by system system is going to select the features right here uh, the, the features will be selected by the system itself so there is no human intervention in case of deep learning so we can say that deep learning is like human because here we have a concept of human brain right right and uh, we can actually try to create a human like brain as if as if our brain works we want our machine to work in the same way so making an artificial brain is basically called as artificial intelligence right and uh, it's a part of ai only right deep learning is a part of it so in deep learning we actually have three types let's try to discuss about those three types let me tell you uh, one by one so in deep learning let me write down uh, i hope you people are able to understand a basic difference between these i just wanted to tell you that in machine learning there is human intervention but in deep learning there is no human intervention that's a basic difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning right now as i told you that in case of deep learning we have three types basically let me uh, let me try to talk about those three types so the first one as as i already uh, told you in the agenda and that is nothing but artificial neural network right so let's see what is this artificial neural network in a short i think uh, you have already been introduced to this neural network term right but as i am going to uh, implement this particular thing so let me just give an introduction about this in a short and then we will continue with the uh, implementation so artificial neural network then there is something called as convolutional neural network let's see what is the difference between uh, artificial neural network and convolutional neural network and then obviously there is a recurrent neural network. so let's see what are, what all these things can do okay so we call it as an cnn and rnn okay now what is an so in short 
uh, ANN. If you want to see, uh, if you want to understand the use of ANN, so generally artificial neural network is used for numerical data. Whenever there is a numerical data, ANN is preferred. Okay, because it has been seen that uh, it gives high accuracy for numerical data. Right? But it doesn't mean that you cannot make use of artificial neural network for image data. Yes. it can be used for image data and so right but it gives high accuracy for numerical data that's why you might have seen many people saying that artificial neural network is used only for numerical data but it's not the case actually it can be used for image data actually you will see when when i will develop the model you will see that ann is the thing which we need to make use of ultimately that's what is going to happen i i will talk about that so for numerical data it is going to give high accuracy uh, and it That, that doesn't mean that it cannot be used for image data. Yes, obviously it can be used for image data as well. Talking about this one, convolutional neural, uh, neural network. Okay, so convolutional neural network is generally used for image data. Whenever there are problems to be solved, whenever there are models to be trained, uh, models to be created on the basis of image data, we use convolutional neural network. Right, but we can use it for text data as well it doesn't mean that you cannot make use of cnn for image data it can be used for text data as well but image data will have higher accuracy in case of cnn that is the reason okay now talking about this third thing recurrent neural network now what is this why it is actually used so generally the concept behind recurrent neural network is something called as lsp okay what is this lsm lsm actually stands for <laughs> long short term memory you know what is the meaning of this so actually this word itself tells you what is this uh, lsm long short term memory that is nothing but lsm let's see what is this uh, lsm first okay so uh, you might be knowing that right, uh, in our brain there is the short term memory right which which actually enables us to remember uh, a short memory data right so for example for uh, just say like uh, today i am discussing some concept so maybe uh, whatever i am discussing today that 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 will be remembered by you people for two days for three days right and if you don't basically practice all these things you are going to forget all this right and that's actually a short term memory so you remember something for short period of time that's what that exactly similar concept is here in case of this right talking about this rnn recurrent neural network it can be used for uh, different applications like specifically recommendation systems so uh, those people who are trying to uh, work in this kind of a domain in recommendation systems definitely uh, you can make use of recurrent neural network right but let me tell you even you can make you can actually create recurrent uh, recommendation systems in uh, machine learning also okay but but let me tell you whatever you can do with machine learning you can do all those things with computer but why vice versa might not be true in some part okay so uh, generally <clears throat> concept behind this one is lsm it can be used for recommendation systems for example you might have heard about or you might have seen right google searches is the best example of uh, applications of recurrent neural network or maybe uh, for example predicting the next world right you know that when you type try to type something in google right or uh, predicting next word or yes obviously flipkart is there amazon is there youtube all those things actually make use of recurrent neural network so in short that's a simple introduction about artificial neural network convolutional neural network and recurrent neural network i hope everyone is uh, clear please now let me clear this and let me show you some notes which you people can refer here uh, for deep learning in which i have given a uh, simple introduction about deep learning both in deep learning and this one this is the ip band if i <clears throat> again if you people are interested i'll be telling on this okay. so here uh, deep learning as i told you it makes use of concept of neuron we will see what is neuron actually and what are the other things which are required so see here what is deep learning so to understand deep learning what deep learning is we first need to understand the relationship between deep learning and machine learning that's what that's what i actually try to discuss right i told you in case of 
machine learning there is human intervention but in case of deep learning there is no human intervention that's a basic difference between machine learning and deep learning and obviously what is neural network and artificial intelligence we already talked about right many times you can say neural network is actually a part of uh, deep learning so if you people remember i i have given you this diagram right so under ai you have ml under ml you have deep learning and even we talked about data science so here uh, you will find out in these notes uh, basic concepts about the deep learning what is deep learning actually and the concepts related to that i'll be able to discuss all these things in a short so that we will directly go and we will discuss everything and all the packages which i have shown you dl4j right deep learning for java it is jvm based with distributed and it integrates with hadoop and spark right this is a framework you might be going so kiano it's a very popular in academia and it is interspaced with Py, uh, python and numpy torch is there it's your base in house which is by facebook and twitter tensorflow and i think i did not tell you one point uh, tensorflow is actually a successor to kiano remember that that's why you might not have might not have heard about kiano you might have heard about uh, tensorflow but yes tensorflow is actually a successor of kiano which is developed by google and cafe a uh, non general purpose and it is actually based on c++ and it's very fast okay and uh, it is given who developed who is the person responsible for uh, concept of deep learning and all this thing is given all the mathematics involved is given here what is perceptron what is neuron what is uh, all those concepts are explained what is neuron what are the different different layers so you can obviously refer to all these things okay so i will not go inside all these things now what i will do is i will directly go and try to discuss with uh, try to discuss the concept of artificial neural network which we are going to implement so before implementation let me clear some of the points with some example so an what is artificial neural network for example suppose uh, let's take a example that we want to create a model we are where we are going to create uh, we are going to predict whether uh, image is having a cat or a dog right predict a cat and a dog in image that's what suppose that, that's that's the model we want to create or we want to train to the help of training data okay suppose let's suppose this is the image given to us <clears throat> and there is one animal maybe something like this okay. so this is the animal now the problem statement is to identify whether it's a cat or a dog suppose zero means cat and one means dog because you know for uh, whether it's machine learning deep learning data should always be in numerical format right so in artificial neural network what happens is uh, we have different different layers right so we have a layer called as input layer you might have heard about this okay there is a layer which is called as hidden layer again you might have heard this particular name and obviously there is one more layer that is output layer. okay so input layer hidden layer and output layer so as as i said that this is the image in which there is the image of some animal and our target is to identify whether it's a dog or a cat suppose by using some technique okay uh, how to convert the image into uh, zeros and ones and how to divide the image into parts that we will see in implementation directly but let's suppose this image is converted to zeros and ones by using some uh, technique by using some pre processing technique. okay so in case of input layer in case of hidden layer in case of output layer so there is something called as uh, neurons we will discuss after this one only we will discuss what is the concept of neurons or what is a neuron let me tell you first of all in in case of input layer or first of all how many input layers are possible the number of input layers is one how many output layers are there number of output layers are also one and how many hidden layers are there so number of hidden layers are n okay so how to decide what is the value of n so it actually depends on what type of a data you have or maybe it actually depends on what type of a problem statement you are trying to solve okay and <clears throat> suppose if you are uh, suppose if you have developed the model and if you are getting very less accuracy so what you can do is you can increase number of hidden layers what did i say i will again repeat number of input layers 
is one. Number of output layers is one. Number of hidden layers is n. And how it is decided? It is decided depending on the data. What type of data is available to you? May be decided upon the problem segment. Or I said one more thing that if you have developed the model and if you see that your accuracy is very less, in that case, what you can do is you can go and you can increase the number of hidden layers. Why? You will get that. But before that, let's try to discuss what is neuron. Right? What do you mean by neuron? Let's try to discuss about all this. So in all layers, whether it's input layer, hidden layer, or output layer. So in all layers, we have something called as neurons. Right? Now, what's a neuron? So uh, if you just go and try to uh, Google this neuron, you will get a diagram. Right? So you might be knowing human, uh, human body is having neurons. It's not like that neurons are only present in brain. Neurons are present in all the parts of the body. Right? So now what is a neuron actually? So it's an important part of our brain which carries our signals from one neuron to another neuron. So with the help of neuron information can be transferred, right? So uh, what we want here is in case of deep learning or neural network, what we want here is we want artificial neuron, right? So here we want artificial neuron. In case of human brain, in case of human body, there are neurons which are responsible for transferring information from one neuron to another neuron. On the similar hands, we want artificial neuron. Okay. So, uh, and, and we want uh, those neurons to work the same way these uh, neurons in the brain work. Right? So, let's now see how, how basically the artificial neuron actually works. Let me clear this. Okay. For example, we were having an image here, right? This was the image we were having, suppose. In case of input layer, suppose I have two neurons. Again, how to decide the number of neurons? That also we will see with the example. Suppose in input layer, this is our input layer, two neurons. In hidden layer, let's suppose we have two neurons, one, two. And, and in output layer, one neuron. Right? So this is your hidden layer. This is your output layer. This is what we have right now. Okay. So input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. So and what are all these circles? These are you can suppose that uh, you can just take, uh, take it as neurons. They are neurons. Two neurons. So here I have two neurons, here three neurons, and here one neuron. Now in input layer and hidden layer, the number of neurons. In input layer and hidden layer, the number of neurons is in our hand, right? But in output layer, it can be according to some rule, right? I will again repeat. In case of input and hidden layer, how many number of neurons you can give? That is in our hand. But in case of output, if you want to decide how many number of neurons should be there, it is actually based on some rule. What is that rule? That we will talk about. So we will discuss the rule which will actually help us to decide number of neurons in the output layer here. Okay, so after that, what now as neurons in the human body are interconnected, so all neurons are internally connected, right? So it is like this. So this particular neuron is connected to this one, it is connected to this one, and it is connected to this one. All neurons are internally connected, like this. Okay, let's suppose like this. And it is like this. Okay. And similarly, here also. So that is the meaning of the statement that told you all neurons are internally connected. Now, see, as I said, we are going to apply some techniques on this image, and this image will be converted into zeros and ones. Right? So, by applying some uh, image processing technique, you can say we will divide that image into two parts. Maybe suppose like this. Actually, uh, actually, we do not divide the image into two parts, but we apply some mechanism, right? And we just try to separate the data. So data will go in the form of an array, I can say. So from here, some data will go, and from here, some data will go. But that data is going to go in the form of array. That's what I, uh, that's why I, I told you that uh, it is going to divide our image into two parts. But actually, it is not going to divide it into two parts. The data will be converted into, in, it will be converted in the form of an array. So what I can say is, 
here whatever we are going to get is array data okay suppose this is input 1 and this is input 2 as i say input 1 i am i am writing it down that is known as i1 and i2 okay now if i am saying that this is i1 and this is i2 so now the question is <coughs> here i am getting i1 and i2 okay now the question is what will we get here what will we get here and what will we get here right what will be the output of these neurons what will be the output of this i1 what will be the output of this i2 okay so that is actually dependent on some mathematical formula right or mathematical equation with and which we actually make use of for artificial neural network so let me uh, write down that equation uh, so for what purpose that equation is used that is going to help us <clears throat> for getting the output of these things okay this is what wherever i have written the question marks so the formula or the uh, mathematical equation for artificial neural network it is something like this summation of i is equal to 0 to n i will tell you what is this n i i into w r okay plus something called as bias we will see each and everything what are all these things okay so summation i equal to 0 to n i i into w r what is this i this is nothing but input right i1 i2 what is this wi this is nothing but weight what is weight we will talk about that okay <clears throat> and what is bias we will see what is bias and why why one should go and one should try to add the bias what is there why there is a need to add the bias we will, we will talk about that so in i i is nothing but the input wi is nothing but the weight what do you mean by that so see weight is nothing but any random number that we have assigned to the neurons at 0.01010 anything any random number. so uh, which we assign to the neuron initially it is going to be random weight it's like a priority i think weight is like a priority right so what is this it's a priority which we assign to all the neurons or i can say it's a weight okay now what do you mean by this for example just to understand the concept of this for example let's say there are three friends right so there are three friends a b and c and all of them they are hosting a party right so and they are hosting the party on the same day at the same time that is at the evening but separate now here you have a uh, we have a question right here you will see uh, whose party you are going to attend now you will see that who who is the friend who is closer to you for example let's suppose b is the friend who is closer to you right that means what that means you have assigned more weight there is more weightage for friend b right now you will go and you will attend b is fine so it's having higher priority right whatever is having higher priority that that particular thing will be having the higher weight i can as simple as that so what is that weight weight is nothing but the priority initially it is going to be a random one. okay how how we are going to make it of that so we are going to make it some random function from the python at the time of implementation you will understand it okay so just try to understand all this concept because same thing i am going to implement in python at that time it is going to become more clear right so as i said that initially it is going to be random right but but initially we don't know uh, all this priority so the priority or the feature selection will be done by the system itself so whatever the random values which are going to assign as a weights to all these neurons that will be assigned by the system itself so initially we will provide random value of the weight that's what i was trying to uh, tell you right so as i told you that priority of feature selection will be done by the system itself that is the basic difference between machine learning and deep learning here system it is going to decide about which uh, to which feature it should give more importance here that is neuron right so to which neuron we should actually go and try to assign more weight system is going to decide that. for example let's consider uh, let me name this neuron as x let me name this neuron as y and this one as z Okay, so let's consider neuron X. Okay, so there are two lines which are coming to neuron X. Which are those two lines? So this is the first line, right? And this is the second line. Neuron X and is uh, there are two inputs to that. You can say. Suppose let me uh, assign some weights like 
W1 here and W2 here. Okay. Similarly, let me assign the weights for Y and Z also. Let's suppose for Y, the weights are like this, WA and suppose this is WB. And maybe for Z, it is WI and it is WJ. So what is weight? I already told you. Right? These are the uh, weight is nothing but the priority and initially the weights are going to be random. That's what I told you. Now, so we have assigned all these names or, or, or the weights. Okay. So for X, Y and Z. Now what will be the output of U on X? Right? Th that's what we want. So for this particular equation, we will try to calculate what will be the output of X. So if I go and if I have to make use of the same equation for calculating the output of x, it is going to be something like this. What is this? I1. So I will write down I1 into what is the weight? W1. So W1. What is this sign? Summation sign, right? This, this particular sign is what? Summation sign. It means I should add. What I get is I2. What is the corresponding to? It is W2. So I2 into W2. So summation of ii into wi, same thing, summation sign you know how it works. So i1 into w1 plus i2 into w2 plus there is some bias. What is bias? Now that's what we are going to discuss. Suppose, let's suppose the result of these, this particular equation is approximately 0 0.54. Let's suppose it is 0 0.54 and let me write down this equation as 1. Let me number this equation as 1. Okay. So uh, let's suppose we get, uh, we got value 0 0.54 after solving this particular equation. For now, you just assume that. What is bias? That will be see later. Okay. Now, as I said that this is the result, I am assuming that 0 0.54 is the result. Now, we need to add bias to this. Now, let's see. Why? How I actually telling you we need to add bias? Because in the equation it is given, right? So, what is bias? So, we need to add bias. Bias is what? We, we actually use bias to keep the neuron active. Now, what do you mean by that? In case, if suppose the value of I1, I2, it is 0. So, in that case, the value of this one, this equation 1, is going to become what? It is also going to become 0. So, if we do not add bias, the value 0 will be going to be if it is going to be here, that is the output of x. If you do not add bias, in which case, if i1 or i2, if it is 0, this value is going to be 0 because, because of this equation, right? So that means the neuron x will become inactive. And inactive neuron means what? It means like some part of the brain is not working. And that is not good. So to keep the neurons active, we add some bias value. And bias is a very small value. So uh, let's suppose I am adding a bias value as maybe 0 0.02, right? So see here, <clears throat> what was uh, in equation one? What did we what did we assume? In equation one, we assume that the result is 0 0.54. So let's suppose the bias value which I am going to add is very very small. So 0 0.54 plus a very big, small bias value I am going to add, and that is 0 0.02. Suppose. So the result which I am going to get is suppose 0. 6, this I will name it as equation 2. Okay, so after getting the value as 0 0.56, we can pass this particular value to some another function and that is called as activation function. So there comes the concept of activation function. Okay, so whatever value we got, so, so what are we assuming now? Now we, assume, we are assuming that the value we got here is 0 0.56 after adding the bias. I hope everyone is able to understand the concept of bias. Bias is a very small value, a negligible value I can say, right? So, uh, and why it is added? So that a new neuron is going to become inactive. That is the reason why we actually add bias, okay? So, as, as I, I was talking about uh, bias, right? <laughs> Let me tell you, what is the range? As I told you that, I have, I have used 0 0.02 value as a bias, value, right? Let me clear this thing and let me show you something uh, which is provided by Google itself. See, uh, let me open a tab. So, Google has actually developed a lot of very good projects which one can make use of. There is something called as, you might be knowing about this, uh, TensorFlow Playground. Some of you might have used it. Okay. 
So see, TensorFlow Playground, here what you can do is you can go and you can try to play with the deep learning uh, model. You can go and you can get the data, get the features, add the hidden layer, add the neurons and all those things. So see, here what's happening is, you can check it. There is something called a learning rate. There are something called an activation functions. Uh, regularization. Regularization rate. So this is nothing but uh, uh, regularization rate, which actually one can make use of in uh, machine learning. So if you want to go and if you want to regularize your model, right? So learning rate. How you how you want your model to learn? So see, this is the range. This is the range. So starting with 0 0.1, uh, starting with 0 0.00001 to 10. This is the learning rate. So what you can do here is, if I go and if I try to click on this, this is going to train the model. There is something called a epoch. What is epoch? We will try to see that in our model. We are going to make use of that. But once you understand all these things, I will recommend that you go here and try to play with this kind of model. For example, your data set is like this. If your data set is like this, if your data set is like this. So see, it is showing you everything. You can go and you can add as many more vendors as you want. If you want to go and increase the number of neurons, you can increase that. Right? Here also you can increase. Right? So this is this is nothing but uh, uh, input layer. These two are the hidden layers, and this is the output. Your so it is actually training the model, right? So learning rate, you can see this is very very small. This is the range. So similarly, bias is also very smaller value, which which actually one can make it. If you once again go and try to show the same. Yeah. So now now the thing is what now we are at which point? Now I told you that as we got this particular value uh, as the output of x, now that value is going to be passed as input to the activation function, right? Now the next thing is what is activation function right so in a short <clears throat> we will try to see uh, what that activation function is and why why i want to go and want to make use of the activation function so what i will do is we are going to need all these things so uh, later on so i will take a screenshot of this and i will try to explore it in this video now what is the activation function? So in short, uh, it is just a mathematical equation which actually brings your output near to the desired output. So activation function is a mathematical uh, equation which brings your output to, the, to your desired output. Now see, there are the different activation functions which are available. So uh, and maybe there are near about 10 to 15 activation functions which are available. If, if you people are aware about something called as uh, maybe you might be knowing about logistic regression algorithm, right? So if you are aware about logistic regression algorithm, you might be knowing that logistic regression algorithm makes use of sigmoid activation function, right? So maybe some of you might be having about uh, the idea idea about all these things activation function. Let me list down some of the activation functions. So see. There are different different activation functions which are available. The first one is uh, sigmoid. Okay. Now you know that in case of linear regression, if you people remember, I told you equation of linear. Uh, in case of linear regression, we use this equation y is equal to n x plus c. Or yesterday I told you y is equal to v zero plus v one x something like. That. Similarly, for logistic regression, as we make use of sigmoid function. So there is an equation for logistic regression. Or otherwise, can anyone tell me what is the equation of uh, sigmoid function? Any idea about this? What is the equation of sigmoid function? Maybe uh, uh, so that we can make my job easy if you are aware about that. Anyone any idea about equation of sigmoid function? Okay. Now see, sigmoid function. It uh, the equation for sigmoid function is something like this. 1 upon 1 plus to the power minus x. And sigmoid function actually looks something like this. Okay, something, uh, something like this. So it starts with 0 and it ends at 1. So whatever the values which you get with the help of. Uh, sir, sir, can you just uh, mute the person? Hello? Anyone there? Sir, if you are there, can you just mute the person? 
So one upon one plus e raised to power minus x. This is the equation uh, of sigma function. And there is a reason why it is actually used because it always gives you the values between zero and one, right? So we will talk about sigma function as we are going to make it of uh, sigma function uh, in our case. So it's an exponential based function, and it, it computation wise, it's uh, really easy. Uh, if you talk about sigma function, it's, it's really very easy. Another function which can be used as an activation function is called as tan h function, or we can call it as hyper tangent function. This is also activation function. Equation of uh, tan h function or hyper tangent function is something like this: e raised to power x uh, minus e raised to power minus x divided by e raised to power x uh, plus e raised to power minus. X. Why am I talking about all these uh, functions? Because they are very very important in, in interviews also. If you are aware about many people actually, uh, many people you might have noticed that in case of data science or machine learning interviews. Uh, Many people are to ask this kind of question. That's what I have seen. Right. So this this uh, tan h function or hyper tangent function is actually a zero centric function. So it is uh, the graph of this particular thing. It looks something like this, something like this. Okay. So positive sign here, one negative sign. Okay. So all all uh, outputs are between minus one and one in case of the hyper tangent function. And for normalization of high data, it is uh, it is actually good. There is one more function which is activation function which is called as ReLU. Again, very famous activation function. It actually stands for a rectified linear unit. And the graph of this ReLU it looks like like this something like this. Okay, so zero, this is y, this is x, into the now. So it always gives uh, whatever is the maximum value of zero and some zero and some other value. It gives maximum of that. It is similar to something called as max pooling in convolutional neural network. Uh, in negative axis, actually, it doesn't give anything, and you will keep on getting a gradient. That is, uh, it, it will change weights in symmetry. Like it is like this. It is it is it is going to change the weights in symmetry. One more activation function is there. That is called as leaky ring. So. <clears throat> It looks uh, something like this. Literally, is like this, something like this. So again, max, uh, this kind of thing is actually makes you go. And it is calculation-wise, this literally is uh, very easy. That's what I can tell you in a short. There is something called as ELU also. That is exponential linear unit. Okay, so exponential linear linear unit. The graph of this. Uh, Something like this. This is negative. This is positive. Okay. And yes, there is one more, a uh, most important function that is called as softmax activation function. Softmax activation function. So in TensorFlow, we actually many times make use of uh, this. Okay. So uh, equation of this softmax activation function is this. S of x i is equal to e raised to power x. Uh, e raised to power x i divided by summation i equal to one to n e raised to power x i something like this. This is the equation of softmax activation function, and which is very very important. For example, I want to give a simple example here. Suppose I have the values like two, three, ten, and twelve, and there is a question: What probability of what is the probability of occurrence of ten? So the probability of occurrence of ten will be calculated like this: e raised to power ten. Divided by e raised to power two plus e raised to power three plus e raised to power ten plus e raised to power twelve. This is the softmax actually used, and it is actually used. Softmax activation function is actually used for multi-class classification. Okay, and yes, there are other functions also. One thing called as p relu. Okay, so p relu is actually parametric relu. The that's what I can tell you right now. And yes, there is something called as Swiss activation function. And there is one more activation function that is called as max out activation function. Okay, so the point of you telling uh, the point of telling you all these things is that at least you should be knowing the names. We will be discussing this particular activation function that is called as sigma. But uh, again, it is not like that. There are only nine. There are about ten to fifteen activation functions which are there, and they are used depending on you. For example, one tenth if I want to write down. It's something called as soft plus. 
this is also activation function okay so the equation of that is something like ln that is log 1 plus exponential of x that is called a soft case so <clears throat> it all depends on uh, what type of a problem statement you have what type of a data you have depending on that you go and you have to make it up activation function so here we are going to make it up sigma let me clear this if i once again go and once again try to show you this one see this is what i was talking trying to talk about see relu is there tan h is there hypertension sigmoid is there linear activation function is there so yes these activation functions are really very very important now i will tell you how to make use of the activation function in our case where are we going to make use of the activation function okay let me show you the same diagram once again okay, i think i think i will have to use that word so as i told you that we got some output right so here in this case we got this this output 0.4 was that 0.26 let me just increase the size of this i hope everyone is able to see this <clears throat> Okay, now if you carefully look, what was the output of that X neuron? It was 0.56. This one. Okay. Now this particular output will be passed as an input to the activation function. So I told you that we are going to make use of uh, sigmoid activation function. So here, talking about that sigmoid, uh, sig as I told you, activation function is just like what? It's a mathematical equation, right? And it is going to help us uh, to get the output closer to the desired output. In our case, what is our desired output? Our desired output is 0 or 1. 0 means cat and 1 means stop. That's what our desired output is. Right? So 0 means cat and 1 means stop. That's what we have actually uh, uh, initialized. Uh, initial that's what we have. Actually, assume we can say. So in this case, if suppose I am using sigmoid function as my activation function, Right, and as I told you that sigmoid function always gives you values between zero and one. So it is like this: if we have this zero, it is as one plus two, yes three, this is minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on. So it is going to be, it is going to be something like this. So between zero and one only you are going to get the values, right? So what happens is what happens is. In this case, we make use of some threshold value that is 0.5. Okay, threshold value is 0.5. So, sigmoid function actually starts with 0 and ends at 1. Okay, so the value of the sigmoid is between 0 to 1. So, here we take threshold value as 0.5. Now, what is the use of this threshold value? So, for example, as I told you that our, our desired output is either 0 or 1. So, in this, with the help of this sigmoid function, how are we going to decide what is going to be the output? So, sigmoid function makes use of threshold value. So, if our received output is greater than 0 0.5, see, if the received output is greater than 0 0.5, then we will make this final output as 1. And if the received output is less than 0 0.5, then the final output is 0. That's how we are going to make use of this sigmoid function. Okay, so here we decide the output according to the threshold value. So in our case, in our case, what was the output? In our case, the output of x is 0 0.56. Right? That's what I showed you by adding the bias. This is what we got. So now compare the 0 0.56 to 0 0.5. So what will be our final output? So as we know that 0 0.56 is greater than 0 0.5. Greater than 0 0.5. That means our final output is going to be what? 1. 1 means what? 1 means what? But this is for what? This is for x neuron. Right? Try to understand. Right? So, if I go and try to show you this particular diagram here, we were getting the output as 0 0.56. And 0 0.56 is greater than 1. As it is, sorry, as it is greater than 0 0.5. And as it is greater than 0 0.5, that means our final output is 1. So, for this x, we got the output as 1. Right? So by following the same steps, okay. So by following the same steps, uh, or by repeating the same steps for y and z, let's suppose 
we got the output as zero here and zero here. That means what we got one zero zero. That means out of three neurons, two neurons are saying that the output is zero, and only one neuron is saying that the output is one. Right? That means finally, what we what kind of a diagram it is going to look like is this is what our i one, this is what our i two two inputs. Right? And these this is what our hidden layer. See you all, and this is what our output layer. And I just said that all of them they are interconnected like this. So let's see what we get as the output finally in the output layer. If we go and if we try to do the same thing, so this is what our x is, this is what y, this is what our z is. So I showed you that we got the output as one here, and we are by repeating the same step. Suppose we got zero here and we got zero here. So not exactly uh, uh, zero. We will get zero point something, and we will compare that value to the. Uh, 0.5 to show, and if it is greater than or less than uh, 0.5, depending on that, final output is going to be zero or one. Right? That's what that's what we do. That's why we use activation function like Hilbert function. That means our <coughs> here in this case, we can say that as it is one zero zero. So that means two two of them they are saying that it is zero. That means it's cat. Only one is saying that it is dog. That is one. That means our brain is more confident for cat as compared to dog. Right? Or, or for example, you can say it is 90% sure that it is cat, and only 10% sure that it is dog. That's what we can. That's what we can say here. Right now, if you remember, we were having some weights here, here, and here. Similarly, what we can do is we can have weights here. Suppose it is W11. Suppose it is W22. Suppose it is W33. Right, and finally we will get the output either as zero or one. If you get zero, it means cat. If you get one, it means dog. So this is going to be the output, either zero or one. It is going to be the predicted output according to the model. Now suppose in the input, let's suppose in the input initially we have dog, but the output we got is cat, right? Suppose initially original image was dog. Our our model, what it is telling us is that it is cat. So that means we got the wrong output, right? So in that case, what we we'll, uh, what we will do is. There are two processes that are going to be involved now, and they are called as back propagation. One is called as back propagation, and one more is called as gradient descent optimizer. So, if you are getting the wrong output, what we should do, or what these models are going to do, gradient descent optimizer. So, what is this? What is this gradient descent optimizer? So, gradient descent optimizer is basically an optimization algorithm which changes the value of weights to to correct the error, or we can say to reduce the error. All these weights. How many weights we were having? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine weights we were having. Right. So, <clears throat> gradient descent optimizer is an optimization algorithm which actually changes the weights to reduce the error or to correct the error. So what basically it will do is it will go back to the previous layer, right? Suppose here we got the wrong, uh, wrong output, so it will go to the previous layer, and it will say that okay, I got the wrong output. Let's correct it. Now this previous layer, in turn, will say to the first layer that we got the wrong output. Let's correct it. So what the first layer is going to do? It will change the value of weight to some other value. That means all the values of all these nine weights, total nine weights are there, right? We are uh, whatever we are using here will be changed, right? And and the same process will be applied again. The complete same process will be applied again unless and until you get the uh, minimum error, right? Or we can say the correct output, right? And suppose and suppose after applying the same process again, we got the output as cat. That is again we got the wrong output. So weights will be changed once more. So the weights will go on changing till till we get the highest accuracy, or I can say least amount of error. Right? Accuracy should be high. So this process is going to be applied again and again to least accuracy or least amount of error. And the weight where we are getting highest accuracy, that uh, that will be your final. Weight. So whatever the values of the weights, which gives us the highest accuracy, those weights are going to be our final weights. 
So we calculate the new weight using back propagation. Okay, there is a formula for the back propagation. We, we will actually talk about that. Okay, see what happens is going back to the layer and changing to new weight. It is called as back propagation. Going back to the layer and changing to new weight. It is called as back propagation. And calculating new weight is called gradient descent optimizer. Right. So the formula E. To calculate the new weight, the formula E W new is equal to W old plus alpha into dy by dx. Now, what is this dy by dx? This is derivative. Okay, this is nothing but what? This is derivative. Can anyone tell me what is the practical application of derivative? Why actually we learn derivative? What is the use of derivative? Can anyone tell? Me? All the participants, even why? Why actually derivative are used? That is, if you understand, if you know the purpose of derivative, that means you will you will get it by using derivative. Anyone can anyone tell me? I hope uh, I am audible to all of you. Why do we use derivative? <laughs> Any idea about that? Right? We we, we have learned derivative in. Anyone? Okay. See, I will tell you. Derivative is used for what? Derivatives are actually helpful to calculate minima. Right? And what do we need? Whether it's a machine learning or a deep learning, what do we need the minima? We need minima of error. Right. Yesterday I have shown you one diagram. I think uh, maybe if not, see if error is here, you go and take the derivative. Error is here. You go and take the derivative. Error is here. So it is called as gradient descent. Right. Go on. So what? What derivative? Go on taking the derivative again and again. Okay. And listen until your error is not minimizing further. So actually, the practical application of derivative is that it always helps us to find out the minima. Okay. So, what this equation, what 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 is the equation is to calculate the new weight W new. W new is what? W new is new weight. W old is what? It is the older weight. And what is this alpha? This alpha is actually it is called as learning rate. Alpha is called as learning. So the one which I have shown you, Google TensorFlow Playground, in that it was there. So it's a, it's this 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 particular thing is nothing but what? It's a learning rate. The value of the learning rate is always between zero point zero 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 one to ten. Generally, we make use of the learning rate as zero point one. It's a standard value. Or many times we make use of this value in real time. Okay. And it should be as small as possible. Okay. Uh, learning rate. Now, what do you mean by learning rate? Learning rate means that is. At at what rate you are changing the value of the weight? At what rate you are changing the value of weight? That is called as alpha. And what is this dy by dx? This is nothing but the derivative, right? And in our case, as we are going to make use of sigmoid function, and the equation of the sigmoid function is something like one upon one plus two raised to the power minus x. So we will be taking the derivative of this. Because see again, why sigmoid function? Because taking the derivative of e raised to power x is easy. I hope you know the derivative of e raised to power x is e raised to power x itself. Okay, so basically, after calculating the new weight, we add that new weight that is alpha into dy by dx. This is our gradient descent optimizer. So dy by dx, which is a derivative of equation function, you know, the sigmoid function, and in this case, we are having sigmoid function. So we will take the derivative of sigmoid function. Whatever the value we get for dy by dx, we add that to the older weight that is the new weight. Right, so this complete process, and remember this equation which we are going to require. Okay, this equation we are going to require to calculate the new weight. So this complete process is actually known as back process. Right, so this is how it is going to calculate the new weights by using this particular equation. Now, how to find out that model is having error? Suppose I am getting the desired output as zero. Uh, or maybe the predicted output. Uh, the predicted output uh, is zero. So what you can say, desired output is zero, but the uh, but the output which I am getting is one. So error will be one, one minus zero one. Okay. 
and maybe suppose uh, so in this case the error in this case is one suppose if we are getting predicted output as zero okay and the actual output is also zero so zero minus zero what is the error in this case the error is going to be zero so what we do is we take the average of all the errors and we see that how much average we are getting if you are getting higher error that means the model is not correct we have to train it again okay so let me clear all these things so if i give you a simple example what happens is uh, a very simple example suppose uh, like like in real time so uh, for example to explain uh, this particular thing suppose in this case right just uh, suppose i am your instructor right now right and i am i am actually discussing uh, some concept with you right uh, in this session so suppose in a class to a single participant i am i am teaching some and i am i am i am actually teaching that particular concept every day okay so in that case as the same thing will be repeated many times again and again same thing is going to be same concept i am teaching to that particular participant again and again right so that that particular uh, participant will become more accurate in that concept day by day now every day at the end at the end of the day or after teaching what i am doing is i am i am conducting a test of that participant through to viva or some other ways maybe for example i am asking uh, that person some questions for example tell me this or that tell me the answer of this or that right and suppose the participant gives me wrong so what i can do is i will i will take some quick action against that particular person so that he will he will uh, think again go back in the mind think again about whatever i have taught and then give me the answer or the out for example if second time also that person gives wrong answer what i will do i will repeat the same process that is take some quick action like this i will ask the question again and again and if he gives the correct answer i will tell him that okay it's correct and that's fine that means again and again if i am asking the question and he is giving the correct answer that means he has been trained well but if he has been giving wrong answers that means he has not been trained well so he needs more training that is there is a need to teach him more then only he will start giving the correct answer so that a simple example to understand the same process whatever we talked about gradient uh, back propagation gradient descent optimizer exactly the same thing is happening here in this case right now <coughs> that is called as artificial neural network that's what artificial neural network is see once you understand the concept implementation understanding of implementation is not going to take that much time now what i will do is here just to understand this concept right i will give one example Same example I am going to implement in Python, and then we will create a model with the help of artificial neural network. So, what type of example I am going to, or what type of problem segment we are going to solve now? Is let me show you a very simple example. What we will do is uh, let's suppose uh, uh, it's, it's like a binary data I am going to take, or we can say gate kind of a data. So, let's suppose we have ten inputs. Okay, let's take a very small example. We have ten inputs and one output. Okay, this is the example I am going to implement first. Now let's suppose the inputs are like this. These are the features: x1, x2, and x3. Okay, and the output is y. Okay, this this is what this is my output. Okay, so now here, as I said that we are going to make use of a simple data set. Okay. Let's suppose in this case the number of rows I have four. Okay, first input is maybe suppose zero, one, zero. Okay, second input is suppose one, zero, one. Third one is zero, zero, and one. And fourth one is one, one, zero. And the desired output or, or the actual output is zero, one, zero, one. Right. Now let's see how to create a deep learning model. Let's let's try to suppose. Uh, let's try to create that. See. Uh, just suppose this is our actual output. This y is our actual. Output. Now, what we want is we want to create a simple neural network for this, day, and we want the output for these four samples. Okay, for these four samples, uh, like like it is given in y, same output which is given in y for these four samples. This is what we want. 
so that will be our simple neural network so whatever the output we will get we will compare that output to this actual output that is one okay and then we will see how much error we get and and that's what our problem statement is which we will see to uh, python code now okay so so whatever we have discussed till now we will write down the code for each and every step and try to understand uh, that simple neural network so what i will do now is uh, just remember these values this is what we are going to do okay uh, let me go and try to open jupyter notebook now here i am here i am in the jupyter notebook i will open a new notebook as this is our first example i will try to type the things and i will try to tell you it will not take much much of the time see i did not clear it because i just want to clear this okay so as we want to create a simple neural network model what i will do is obviously i am going to need a package that is called as numpy without numpy i cannot okay. so import numpy as input you are already aware of that i am just importing this particular package okay after that i will create a variable called as inputs now what are the values in the inputs let me show you it once again let me undo yeah so in input we have 0 10 let me write it down here see i want inputs like 0 10 101 001 101 110 and the output expected output is 0 10 0101 0 1 0 1 Let me clear this. Okay, so what I will do is first of all I will create a variable. In that variable I will store the input data as well as the output data, and then based on that we will train the model. So input is equal. To. How to create the array in NumPy? So we use a letter called as np dot array. Okay. <clears throat> brackets here. One more square brackets here. And now I am going to give the input. So what is what is the first input? It is zero one zero. So zero comma one. Uh, sorry. Zero comma one comma zero. Right. What is the second row? Se uh, second row is what? One zero one. So one comma zero comma one. Okay. Then what is third row? Zero zero one. Zero comma zero comma one. And last row is one one zero. One comma one comma zero. Right. This is what our input variable is, which we actually named it as inputs. So let me run. Right. Now my inputs look like this. Uh, inputs looks like this. <clears throat> After this, I will also have to create one more one more variable, which is going to store outputs, the actual output. So I will again create an array. Again, we will create an array. Number. So np dot array. Now what I need is I need zero one zero one. So the first output is zero. Second output is one. One more output is uh, again zero, and again is one. Right? This is what I have written here. So zero one zero. Just take it. I think I did not make any mistake. Zero one zero one zero one zero zero one 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 zero and zero one zero one. Yes, that is right. Let me run. And this is what my output variable looks like. Uh, oops. Okay. Zero one zero. Now we have input as well as output. Now the next step is we need to apply the formula. We have inputs, but we do not have weights, so we need to assign random ones. Because if you people remember, we have already seen the formula, right? Uh, and in that formula, summation of i to i equal to zero to n, i i into w i plus y, right? That was the formula. Same formula I am going to make it up here. So what I will do is for that, so let me write down the formula so that you will remember it. See. Summation of i equal to zero to n i i into w i plus y is called the formula. Right. So what we will do is now here we do not have weights. We have inputs, but we do not have weights. So I told you initially the weights are going to be what random. So what I will do is weights is equal to n p dot as they are going to be random. So I am going to make it up. Variable. This is the middle variable in NumPy. Np dot random dot random, and I am going to generate random numbers. How many random numbers I should generate? I should watch it. 
So I, I, I need that particular shape like this, P comma one, because because of the input and out. Because anyway, I'm going to do the dot product. So see, if you want to see the way how it looks like, it's how it looks. So you can see it's a two dimensional array. I hope you understand basic things about it. Now we have x, we have inputs, we have outputs. Now we are going to calculate this summation, right? This sum. So what I will do is sum is equal to what is that? Np dot dot. Np dot dot is a dot product, right? Again, I will label in Python by the so dot product of what? Dot product of inputs, comma, weights. I I into W I, right? That this one. I I I one into W one plus I two into W two and so on. Plus plus what we need to add? We need to add bias. Suppose the bias value is very small value zero point zero, or any other small value if you want, you can go and you can take. So if I go and I try to run it, I am going to get the sum like this. Okay. Now, now next step is to apply the sigmoid function, right? And I told you how is this? the equation of sigmoid function is what the equation of sigmoid function, which we have seen is one upon one plus e raised to the power minus x, right? This is what we are going to apply. So, what we will do in the implementation is we will define a function. Which I will name it as activation. So sigma function is one of the activation function rule. So define activation of x. I am giving a variable name as x here. What it should return? It should return one upon one plus uh, e raised to the power minus x. How I can write it down? So one divided by uh, one plus. How I can write down this particular term? One plus e raised to the power minus x. So one divided by one plus n p dot. Exponentiation. So there is something called a GSP in number. Exponentiation of minus x. This is what the definition uh, we can write down for sigmoid function in Python, right? And just run. So we define. We simply define a function. That means here in x, uh, here whatever the value we will pass, it will apply the sigmoid function to that particular value. And basically, it will convert that sigmoid function uh, in between zero to one, right? And what uh, What will x? Uh, what will what is actually x here? X is going to be the value of the sum, right? So when that is done, now I will try to create a variable called as y prediction. And in y prediction, I am going to apply a activation function for which value? For sum. Just go and calculate it, and then see what is the prediction, right? Now we got prediction like this: 1.85, 1.28, 1.61, 1.39. 1 so this is the value which we got as a prediction the first day. So here we are just taking two two layers, that is input layer and output layer. No hidden layer is there, right? So basically we use the hidden layer when we have complex problem statements. But here in this case we have a very simple problem statement, right? Now whatever the value we got, that is uh, one point something. So this is greater than zero point five, so final output is one. Greater than zero point five, final output is one. Greater than zero point five, final output is one. This is also greater than zero point five, final output is one. That means Why? Why greater than zero point five? I am checking because zero point five is our threshold value according to sigma function, right? So at last we got the value as one 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 one, right? But this is not our desired output. Our desired output is what zero one zero one, right? So now we need to go and we need to calculate the error. So how to calculate the error? So let me show you. Error is equal to Whatever what we have outputs outputs minus whatever we have in y prediction go so here and you will see the error so so what error we are getting here this is what the error is in our case right so this error should be near to zero then only we will get good results right so this this in this case this outputs is the actual output and y prediction is the prediction but here it is not this particular error is not near to zero and it's very high. Why? Why is it so? Why this error is very very high? Because we have not trained the model, right? It's simply like uh, today I taught you and I conducted the exam or test. So obviously, first time only one might not give the correct answer, and definitely there will be a chance of mistake. So in that case, I should train that person more. That means we need to apply gradient descent optimizer and back propagation so that the error should be reduced. Right, and if you remember, <clears throat> what I told you, uh, gradient descent is what alpha into dy by dx. Right. So what is this dy by dx? This dy by dx is actually the derivative. 
derivative of what this is the derivative of activation function what is activation function in our case sigmoid function so you should be able to calculate the derivative of sigmoid function right so what will be that dy by dx of 1 upon 1 plus t raised to power minus x uh, and uh, what is the derivative of 1 upon 1 plus t raised to power minus x if you want to find it out what i have done is i have created a separate document for that if you want you can go and you can actually refer that particular document as so i think it is already open so yes see how to calculate the derivative of sigmoid function if you want this uh, again in the document i have given this is the sigmoid function if someone is not aware about the derivative this is what sigmoid function looks like okay this is how you uh, derivative you can calculate you have dy by dy by dx of 1 upon 1 plus raised to power minus x step for it is shown with explanation and finally if you go and if you try to apply all this x the derivative which you will get is something like this sigma of x into 1 minus sigma of x okay sigma of x into 1 minus sigma of x and this diagram actually shows you this blue line shows you the actual uh, sigmoid function and the red line shows this red line shows you the uh, graph derivative you see this for the okay so the point is this is what the derivative otherwise you will ask me how i got the equation like sigma of x into 1 minus sigma of x because this is what i am going to make use of in my code now this is the derivative of what this is derivative of sigmoid function that is our activation function in our case so dy by dx that is the value of dy by dx okay so that that's why what i will do is once i calculate the error and we got the error very very high so what we will do is now we will apply that proportion and the gradient descent optimizer so here i will write down a function called as gradient okay i will name the function as gradient define gradient which is going to take two arguments one is x that is input and another one is e that is error So x and e, I am going to pass it. And what it is going to return? It is going to return dy by dx. That means we are going to take the derivative again and again, again and again, till we get the highest accuracy and minimum error. That's what we are going to do. So what is the what is the derivative? <laughs> what is the derivative actually? Just now I showed you in this particular document. The derivative is sigma of x into one minus sigma. Of x. Right. So according to that, what it is going to return is it is going to return derivative. So e into that is error into uh, sig, uh, sigma of x into one minus sigma of x. Right. In bracket, what I will do is x into one minus x. It is because the derivative of sigma function is like this. That's why I have written the gradient function uh, like this. That's why I have written the definition of gradient function like this. I hope everyone is able to understand why we have written like this. Okay. So in Python, this is just a simple function which we have defined. I am going to run. Let me just, yeah. Now that is done. So after that, I am going to calculate y prediction again. So y prediction is equal to what? Activation of some value. Run it. After that, okay. So again, if you want to go and if you want to see the y prediction, uh, you can go and you can see that. So I have I have actually written already run that if you want to see it here you will see this is the y prediction okay now when that is done again go and again calculate there so here we are going to get the same because we have not applied that gradient so what I will do is outputs minus y prediction that is going to be our error so let me go and let me run the error. After that, okay, this is uh, what prediction is done. Okay. After that, after calculating the error, now as it is going to change the value, so what I will do is we are going to declare a variable as change weights is equal to here. I am going to apply gradient function which we have created earlier. Gradient function, and it is going to we are going to pass it as what we are going to pass. Two two variables that is y prediction comma error okay y prediction and error these are the two values which are going to pass so what is this change weight going to do that is how much change we need to do in the weights that's what we are going to calculate so gradient of y prediction comma error what
what is gradient gradient is the function which we have already defined okay so okay i think okay i think i did not add bias uh, so when i calculated uh, when i defined the gradient this one. see when i defined this particular thing uh, gradient actually here we should go and we should have calculated this sum because uh, i once again dot product same thing actually again if you do not do it no problem okay so what what is this this is nothing but i i i1 into w1 plus i2 into w and so on so here i should have had a bias 0.2 same bias i am going to make because if you want to add another value yes you can go and you can add that so let me run this one okay. and then again go and try to calculate this so y prediction now you go and display y prediction okay and now you display here so this is this was what it is now change this so y prediction and error these these are the two values which are going to pass to the gradient and in gradient it is just a derivative let me write okay so <clears throat> that's what we got in change this now how you calculate weights so so new weight is equal to old, old weight plus derivative right so what i will do is weights is equal to weights plus np dot again this is a dot product now inputs we have what i will do is i will take a transpose of this why transpose i will take it is just to make the multiplication possible nothing to see change this why am i why am i taking the transpose of this because here i am trying to multiply see if i pull here if i go and if i try to check the size or shape right this is a better available in five if i go and try to check the shape of inputs it is 4 by 3 four rows and three columns right if i go and if i try to check the size of change underscore weights or uh, shape of change underscore weights what it is it is four rows and one now you might be knowing a uh, basic rule of matrix or multiplication in fact yeah so this value and this value should be equal right so that's why what i'm doing is i'm just taking the transpose of input so that it will become three four and this value and this value will become four right that is the only purpose so weights is equal to old weight plus alpha into dy by dx that's what i am trying to do here okay so np dot dot of input dot t is nothing but a transpose And change it. Let me run it so that it will calculate the new one. Okay, so it calculated the new one. Now, here if I try to check error, obviously I will get the same. Right? Uh, but if we execute this particular code again, so how many number of times you want to execute this code? It all depends on us. So, for example, I will execute this code. Thousand number of times. So for that, what I will do is whatever step I show, I will write down a for loop. For some variable i, else function you might be doing it is a default function available in Python. So I want to run all these steps one thousand times. Why one thousand times? Because I want to teach this particular thing to to the to the machine one one thousand number of times. It is exactly the same thing. If you teach any person same thing again and again, again and again, obviously he or she is going to remain uh, remember it for longer time, and he or she is going to Understand it in more detail, right? Or a deeper, in deeper way, we can say. So, what what things I want to teach? So, the first thing is going to be we are calculating the sum, right? This one. So, sum we are going to calculate that is dot product. So, what I will do is in this for loop, I am going to write on that particular line. Okay. After that, once we calculated the sum, we calculated uh, and we applied activation function, right? So. This is what I was uh, talking about. Activation function we are going to apply. So same code I am writing down, but I am writing it down in for loop because now it is we are going to run those things, or if those things are going to run one thousand number of times. After that, error we are going to calculate, okay? Because anyway we are going to pass the value of the error to the gradient. Let us go to minimize that. 
Gradient is nothing but what error. It is going to minimize the error by taking the derivative again and again. Now, mu weights will be calculated if the error is very very high, right? That's what I am going to do this here in for loop. So, once mu weights are calculated, uh, these change weights are calculated, then mu weight is calculated with the help of this particular command. Mu weight is equal to for mu weight is equal to sorry, mu weight is equal to old weight plus Alpha into divided by x. Same formula we are going to apply. Okay, and uh, once that is calculated, finally we are just going to uh, see what is the error. We are going to display that. Okay? So let me try and see. Okay. So same thing. Whatever the things I have shown you, step by step, same thing I am actually trying to apply here. Whatever, whatever you are able to see here, calculating the sum. Using the equation, prediction, error, changing weights, and calculated error, and then finally calculate the error. So, how many number of times you are trying to run it? You are trying to run it thousand number of times so that it will learn properly. Okay. Uh, yes, Anil Kumar sir, I will be sharing all all these things, yesterday's documents and today's documents with everyone. I will, I will share with Madam. Maybe she will share with all of you. Okay. Now see, I will run it. Now this is what the error. Is. Okay. So <clears throat> now you can see as uh, as as I had, as I got this kind of error. So obviously now we can go and we can see uh, what is the output. So let me go and let me try to check the value of this one. Why prediction? So let me run again. So what is happening here? Okay, right. there is something wrong here. We should have got the value that less than zero, uh, sorry, less than zero point five, because our threshold is that. I think we have missed something. Let me check. Okay, for I in range uh, of one thousand, we calculated the sum that is right. N P dot dot inputs comma weights. This is right, and zero point zero two is the bias. This is what we are talking about, right? Y prediction we are calculating for. Okay, this is the activation of sum. Error is nothing but what output minus y prediction. This is correct. And change weights is equal to the gradient of y prediction comma error. And weights is equal to the weights plus np dot dot. This is the dot product between these two things: inputs or transpose of inputs and change weights. And finally, we are getting the error like this. So let me run it once for i in range of one thousand. Let me run this thirty-one cell once again. Let me run this. Why it is not calculating the prediction? See what I should have got is. Okay, okay. If it is actually less, this particular value is nothing but see. This error is uh, like minus one, which is uh, very much less than zero point five. But what I am expecting is, let me show you this particular code which I have written. Same code which I have written actually. You might have actually uh, missed some a variable. What I'm expecting is like see, same code here. Is here. These are the inputs. See, see, this is our input array. This is what our expected. So our expected output is what zero zero. Now, which we calculated all these things we calculated here, and finally we have written this particular form. Now, what output we should have got is something like this. This is what this is our error, and this is our output. Now, see what I am trying to tell you is, again, steps are same. This value, if you compare, is it greater than zero point five or less than zero point five? This value is less than zero point. This value is what? This value is greater than zero point five. Zero point five is what? Zero point five is the threshold of the sigma function. 
this value is what less than 0.5 and this value is what greater than 0.5 now less than 0.5 means what zero greater than 0.5 means what one less than 0.5 means what zero greater than 0.5 means what one so what is our final result final result is 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 one. and that's what we want to right if you go and if you try to check now this is what we want to initial 0 1 0 1 so what was the output if i go here and if i try to check same example see 0 1 0 1 was the final output so this is actually a simple neural network which we have tried with the same example whatever we have seen with the same steps okay with the same steps whatever we have seen in the in the theory in the explanation right so this is this is a simple example which i want to tell right now as we have very less time what i will do is i will try to show the remaining application directly without typing those four line by line because i hope here you got a very basic i hope everyone has got a basic idea about the working of a model how it actually it is actually developed and what are those hidden uh, layers or uh input layer or output layer and you are right now now what i will do is second example as per uh, as per uh, the agenda which i have discussed right so implement ann in python that's an implement ann for medical that is identifying whether the patient is affected by cancer or not breast cancer or not that's the example i'm going to show you to do now so see for that as i told you uh, once you get all these documents just make sure that you download the data sets from this this file in this in this links file this is a text file which i have given so whatever the data sets which i have used in this session actually the names of all those data sets i have given in this text okay so this text file will also be there for example for covid 19 data uh, you have been given from gitab so we just need to download it maybe because size is huge in this case that's why otherwise other data sets will be there so you will be getting this text file just make sure that you download the data set first right now see let me show you this particular data set now we are going to use this data set and we are going to create the model so let me open this one my book so the next example that is the lab two session let me open a tab let me show you the data set how it looks like what is our target next target is next model is Uh, the model which is going to identify whether the patient is affected by cancer breast cancer or not so the link which i have copied it is going to take you to this data set this is what your data set looks like in this case so maybe let me yeah i think now it is visible okay now see there are columns like id or uh, features like id diagnosis radius mean texture mean perimeter mean area mean and so on near about 29 30 columns or uh, parameters are there which are there and corresponding values are there but here uh, whenever we talk about cancer so there are two classes see whenever we talk about cancer either the patient is benign or the patient is malignant okay malignant means affected by cancer breast cancer and benign means not affected. or you can see positive okay so uh, later on you can understand this particular data set it is uh, csv kind of a data you can see right so link is given here in this part now i will go to the notebook here okay see our target is what our target is to create a model which is going to help us to identify whether the patient is affected by breast cancer or not i am importing numpy package let me run this import panda okay so because we need to why am i using panda because i want to go to this particular link and i want to import the data set you know panda package can be used for that's why so it's a csv file so what i am doing is i am assigning that particular link to this particular value that's it after that if you want to see the uh, output of path Now see pg dot read underscore csv two days panda. I am just going to read a particular file in data variable. And here, if you go and if you try to see data, or maybe if you want to see ten records, data of eight of ten, I will run it. Now see, we will be able to see the first ten records. So try to observe here. 
what are our features and what is our target just see the diagnosis radius mean texture mean perimeter mean area mean and so on so out of all these things this is what our target or output column and all the other columns are our features okay so m means what i told you m means malignant right and there is one more value in this particular column and that is ben malignant means affected by breast cancer and ben means not affected by breast cancer this is all you can take it. so there is one more value m and b also but uh, as we have displayed on the ten record that's why we are not able to see all these things if you want to see the last ten record for the ten days uh Data dot tail and then run. And I think we will be able to see B only. Now see M and B are there okay? because now I am trying to see last thing. So there are near about 358 rows in this particular data set. <laughs> Next thing. I hope everyone has got that idea. Just just try to understand this is what our output column is. After that, I hope you are aware about this particular command. Uh, this is data of uh, diagnosis of unique diagnosis of a target column. It is going to show the unique value from that particular column. I will just run it. So you can see that there is M. M stands for malignant. B stands for benign, right? And here, what are we doing? We are trying to calculate how many number of patient, uh, person, uh, persons are uh, benign and how many persons are malignant. So for that, this is the count. So that means you can see 357 people are uh, not affected by breast cancer. And 202 people are affected by this. Now import the C1, import the C1 package. So C1, you know, uh, C1 is going to help us to plot the graphs. If you want to make use of some other package, you can go and make use of that package, uh, another package. So for plotting, no problem. Now here, what I am doing is I am just trying to plot the graph. So which graph? It's count. Again, same thing. It is just going to show you the count of the people who are malignant and what they. Then for uh, C1 package. After that, you know that yesterday we have uh, the example which we have seen yesterday. In that, the first thing that we have done is we try to do the, the data pre-processing or cleaning of the data. So that's why I am checking: is there any null value in my data set or not? You can see that uh, data dot is null dot sum. Everything it is zero 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 in all the columns. So what are all these? All these are the features in our data. Okay. And what are we doing now? We are trying to divide our data into input and output. What do you mean by this? I location, it's index location. I hope you know that, right? So in pandas, uh, you might have learned that. So colon means all the rows. And why two colon? What is two? Two is nothing but the second index location. And what do we have at the second index location? This is zero. This is one, and this is two. That means from second index location, I want every column because diagnosis is our output column. And ID is not going to contribute anything to uh, the output column, okay? right? That is diagnosis. So that's what it is trying to do. So here we are just trying to divide our data into input and output, x and y. Right? Now there is, uh, if you remember, I told you that for machine learning or uh, for any other algorithm, if you want to create a model, the best, the basic thing is that your data should be in numerical format. See, if I go here and if I try to show you uh, x dot head, okay. I go and if I do x dot head, it is not, it's just a variable. If I go and if I try to do x, we will be able to see something like this. All of these values. Right. And one more thing, if I go and if I try to show y, what is y? Y is diagnosis. So in y, what you get is mb, mb only, malignant and benign. But you cannot train the model with this type of operator. And that's why what we will do is we will try to convert that data into numeric format with the help of something called as label encoder. And that's why I am making this one. So from SKLN dot P processing import label encoder. So I will import label encoder. What is the purpose of that? Just to convert this B and M into numerical format. That is zero or one. Right? Because that's the basic need of uh, creating any model. And I am assigning uh, I am creating an object called as label encoder. Right? And I am fitting Y. Y is what? This is Y right now. Right? But we want Y in zero and one. Right? Now, if you go and if you try to run, uh, see the Y now. Now, Y is going to look like this. Actually, I already run it, but I am just showing in front of you. So, see, one and two. That means what? That means you can check 
m is converted to 1 the okay, first value is what m m is converted to 1 and b is converted to 0 so 1 means malignant and 0 means benign okay after that training and splitting as usual same thing whatever we have done in machine learning right and then here what i am doing is test size is 0 0.15 that means 15 percent of the data is test data and remaining 85 percent of data is training data and standard scalar also i hope you remember right standard scalar just to bring all the values to the same scale so that's what i am doing now from this and fit that training data to the scaling so this is just to make sure that each and every column should have equal values Okay. So scale data I have assigned to this particular variable scale underscore test. Similarly, scale underscore test. Okay, and now we will start with the tensor. So from here, the actual neural network is going to start, or development of neural network is going to actually start. Till now, whatever we have seen is nothing but cleaning the data and putting all the packages. Whatever we do in machine learning. So, right now, <coughs> import tensor flow. So here you will be able to import tensor flow easily because. What are we using? We are using the environment in which we have already installed the tensor flow package as the starter. Right? Those who are present from the start itself, they, they might remember that we have already created the environment called as uh, uh, tf underscore ypm in which tensor flow is already there. Right? So I am just trying to run this particular command. Yes, it has run successfully. Now here I am doing what? I am uh, creating a model. So tf dot eras dot models dot sequential. So see, eras is by default present in here. Yes, it's just that's what I am trying to do. So, adding the layers now, which layers I am trying to add? So, previously we have seen there's the input layer, there's the hidden layer, and there's the output layer. That's what I'm going to make use of. And different activation functions I'm going to make use of. Relu, I already seen you, I told you about this rectified, uh, rectified linear unit, rectified linear unit, and sigma. In theory, I will show you the sigma function. So, whatever the function you want to make use of, that's up to you, that's up to the problem segment or the data set. And then finally, compile compile that particular model. So binary underscore cost entropy is actually used for two class classification. There are different optimizers, optimizers which are available, which you can make use of. Metrics, again, there are different, different options. I am using accuracy as a metrics. Verbose means what? Verbose means to see. That means if you want to see whatever is going on. So verbose means just to see. Right? So I will just try to uh, compile that particular thing. And this is going to be the actual thing. So here, what am I doing is here I am trying to fit the model. That means I am trying to train the model. But <clears throat> on the basis of what? On the basis of training data. So X train, Y train, right? So X train, X is input data, Y is output data. And what do you mean by this epochs? So epoch, epochs is something like suppose if we try to provide the same data set again and again. For example, if we have 100 records in our data set and we try to provide those 100 records again and again for training. That as well as epoch. So what is the epoch value here? It is 150, which is very, very less. It should be very, very high. Right? That means you are passing the same input 150 number of times. So see, it will start the training. Now see, it has started the training. Right? It, is, it has started the training the model. You can see. So in my case, 150 number of times I have passed it. So that is done. You can check it. You can check it. Now see, as and when number of uh, Times it is being trained. So you can see initially the loss was 0 0.64, accuracy was 0 0.16. Loss is decreased, accuracy is increased. Again, loss is decreased, accuracy is increased. Again, loss is in, uh, decreased, accuracy is increased, and so on. Right? So, as many number of times as you go and increase the number of epochs, your model is going to give you good accuracy. So go here and try to do the prediction with the help of model. And 0 0.5, you know that sequence function, actual value 0 0.5. Go and run it and save the output in y prediction and try. And whatever the output you got in true and false, it is nothing but what? So true is nothing but what? Yes, first question is affected by uh, breast cancer, second person is affected by breast cancer. This person false is not affected by breast cancer. So again, you can go and you can convert that into number also or whatever the value you want. Okay, just by writing down the customer. And finally, if you want to go and if you want to know the accuracy of the model, so if you have learned about uh, classification model, you might have come across a concept called as confusion matrix, receiver operator characteristics, and ROC AUC curve. The receiver operator characteristics area under the cross code. So actually, all these things are the metrics which can be used for finding out how your model is actually performed. So uh, 
in sql everything is written see so we want to create something called as confusion matrix that's why we are actually put all those things now cf is equal to confusion underscore matrix y test y prediction and cm i am going to display now what do you mean by this so in our case the meaning of this cf uh, cm or confusion matrix is see this is called as true positive this is called as true negative this is called as false positive this is called as false negative it's true positive means what our model is uh, our model has predicted that there are 45 people who are affected by breast cancer and actually 45 people are affected by breast cancer true negative means what our model is saying that there are 37 people who are not affected by breast cancer and actually 37 people are there who are not affected by breast cancer and what do you mean by false positive false positive means our model is saying that there is zero person uh, uh, so in our case our model is saying that there is zero person actually uh, who is affected by uh, breast cancer so here actually that means our model is right we can understand it what do you mean by false negative false negative means our model is saying that there are four people who are actually not affected by breast cancer right but that is wrong that means 45 plus 37 these that is 7 plus 5 whatever it is total that means our model is able to correctly identify 45 plus 37 people whether they are affected or not affected so that means that is uh, that is good our model is giving some good reason so if you want to see that result in terms of graphs you can go and you can plot this type of a graph it's called as heat map same thing it is actually showing right so and you go and you can try to check the accuracy so i think in our case uh, in our case accuracy is 95% okay so this is what the model for identifying uh, classifying the patient as affected by breast cancer or not let me first show you the next model which helps you to identify whether the image is of a cat or a dog right so this data set i have already shown you let me directly go to the code of this Cat dog identification. So I have once so that once you get this code, uh, you will try to play with that. Okay. So again, what is this? It is convolutional neural network. Right. Now let me show you. Our target is what? Our target is. I will show you an image, a test image uh, with an FDP. This is the image uh, of a dog. Let me show you this. And this image I am going to pass as input to our model. See, I already show you the image training data, uh, and from that we are going to train the model. Helps to identify whether the person is affected, whether the image is of a dog or a cat. You see, this image I am going to pass as input to this model. And it's of a dog. Okay, remember. Now I will go here. Convolutional neural network. Now, what is convolutional neural network actually? See, it is just that it has more number of layers. You can see sequential is there, convolutional is there, pooling layer is there, flatten is there. Right. So these are the layers. So <clears throat> obviously, for uh, I think in one of the sessions, you people have already been introduced to PNN. I think if not, uh, maybe you can go and you can do this about this later on. Right? But here I will show you the model itself. So what I will do, I can go and I can uh, directly import all those things. You can see tensorflow dot kva dot models. From this, I am importing sequential, convolutional, two D. These are nothing but what? These are the names of the layers which we get out of in PNN. Right? <clears throat> so let me show you what uh, it, it is actually successfully running. What am I doing here is I am initializing the CNN, okay, CNN classifier. So let's go here and run it. I am adding different different layers: convolutional layer, pooling layer, one more convolutional layer, and then flattening layer. So how many convolutional, how many pooling layer you want? It all depends on you or the data set, whatever you want. Okay. So let me run this. Add second. This fifth step is showing you second convolutional layer, and finally flattening layer, right? And then full connection. So here I am using activation function called as rectify linear uh, unit, that is really, okay. and then sigmoid function also I am going to make it up. And this is the compilation of our model, okay? And then. Image data generator. As our input is going to be image data here, that's why I'm going to make it as a package. And here, uh, this is what we have done. And here, what are we doing? Is we are just trying to scale the data according to the need. So we have uh, cat and dog as output. Right, that's what we are expecting. 
we are just trying to convert our data according to the right and now see what is this i am passing this particular image in this from this part so the cat dog image in cat dog image i have to show structure should be like that. in this uh, in this cat dog folder i have two folders cat and geodt in cat if you go you will get you will get all the cat images right and in this geodt if you go you will get to see all the dog images right now <clears throat> what i am doing is i am just trying to pass those files to this particular model so that it is going to train so training set and testing set i am passing it it has detected that this many number of images are there with two classes okay and now this is what going to be our training so the actual training is going to start now in which you can see how many number of epochs are there so steps per epoch are 800 but how many number of epochs i have passed only one actually i should have passed more number of epochs but otherwise if i would have passed more number of epochs it would have taken a lot of time so what i have had had done is i am passing input only one number of times but number of steps is 800 okay so so once it is done 800 out of 800 your model will be successfully trained and then you can go and you can predict what is fdp dot jpg image and our model is going to show us the result whether it's a dog or a cat so maybe it will take two to three minutes just to train this particular model uh, and pass the input as this is the number of times and then you will be able to predict for any image right so what is what what it is going on now you can see uh, this is elapsed time actually this much of time it is remaining it is saying that four minutes is going to require it is showing you the loss and the accuracy okay so you can see sometimes uh, accuracy is going to increase as and when number of states are going to increase and loss is going to decrease that's what that's what actually it should happen right let's see, see accuracy has increased you can see it is increased and loss is decreased but ideally let me tell you again that actually i should have given more number of course but otherwise we uh, could have taken a lot of time that's why we will just try it out with only one number of okay so i hope everyone is able to understand uh, all these things right so let let uh, let's wait for two three minutes and once it is done then we can go and we can actually pass the input or uh, input image to it and then we will see whether it is as a output final output or not uh, uh, the output as per our requirement till then anyone any question yes uh, if anyone has question you can unmute yourself and ask the question see this still going on maybe uh, hello sir Yes, sir. Sir, I am basically uh, from mechanical background, mm -hmm. and uh, I have question that if I have statistical features, okay. and if I apply deep learning mm -hmm. for it, mm -hmm. uh, then for reinforcement learning also, if I want to introduce in it, then mm -hmm. what uh, neural network I should consider? So you can go with A N. Anyway, you need to go with A N. Even if you go with R N. So, is reinforcement learning is possible with A N? See, uh, as I told you that. Okay, re reinforcement learning. That means you are talking about uh, re uh, this one, robotics and all those things, right? Uh, sir, just I want to make sure that without any human intervention, okay. uh, this machine learn machine should learn itself with his. Uh... Yeah, 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 madam. So you, you can you can actually if your data is having numbers, you can directly go with it. Okay, and I also I and I can also introduce reinforcement learning into it. Yes, definitely. Depending on what is your depending on your problem statement, right? Depending on that, definitely you can go and you can use of the Okay. Okay, and with the help of statistical features, means mode, mid, mode, median. See, mean, mode, median. Yes, yes, mean, mode, median, and skewness, normalization, standardization. Whatever, whatever you are talking about, all these things are are the things which you require in deep processing. Yes. You are going to need that. Yes. Whether it's deep learning, machine learning. All these features you are going to need. 
यस 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 थैंक यू सर थैंक यू any other question uh, you can ask because we have this is showing us hello sir yes madam sir good afternoon sir yeah good afternoon sir actually i uh, actually i am doing breast cancer prediction sir okay yes. breast cancer i mean mammogram image classification sir mm -hmm. yeah madam uh, in that i uh, in that i am using actually cnn sir okay in cnn actually we are getting that accuracy no sir you have shown the code right right but in the literature papers i have seen that uh, they are using machine learning algorithms like spm uh, ann how can we use those those machine learning algorithms to get uh, accuracy sir uh, so what you can do madam it is it is a to data set it is dependent on data set why they might be using spm is spm actually can you tell me spm what it does with the help of support vector machine what you can do it is dividing uh, uh, into what uh, two uh, hyperplanes like uh, yeah yes yes that yes. means see and that is not the only thing which svm can do actually svm can be used for uh, regression as well as classification whatever you are calling it as dividing it's a classification actually so what happens is if uh, for regression you can make use of svr support vector regressor and for classification you can make use of svc support vector classifier yes, so sir. why they might be using uh, support vector machine kind of algorithm before applying cnn is they need their data in proper format because once you divide your data right once you just segment your data with support vectors what will happen obviously you will you will be getting uh, you will be having only the required things you will not be having the things which are not required or the features which are not required what will happen if you try to add such a features which are not at all required and if you are trying to train the model based on that your model might be overfitted model that might be the reason why they are using support vector kind of things support vector machine kind of things before applying uh, convolutional neural network no actually they are applying after cnn sir okay okay, okay. After so get, after feature extraction okay. so 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 see again again it depends on the uh, again it depends on the requirement only so you can make use of that because whatever the result you got right for breast cancer if you are saying affected or not affected, So whatever the results you get, what you can do is with SVM is you can separate those two. If it's a very huge data, right? Definitely you can apply uh, SVM on that, uh, and maybe you can come up with another model with that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or otherwise, PCA is also there, madam. Generally, PCA is not going to give a uh, a model directly. What PCA is going to do is principal component analysis. It is going to help you uh, for uh, what you can say. Uh, Dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction. Yes, it's a dimensionality reduction technique. It is not going to give you the final output directly. It is not going to give the model. So uh, many times you will find out that when people are using PCA as a pre-processing technique and not as a algorithm or something like that to get the direct model. Is it making okay. sense, madam? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes. they are using based on the data set, sir. Yes, yes, yes. so again it it all depends on what type of a problem segment you are you have or what in what domain you are actually working right it all depends on that okay there is no hard and fast thing that you should do this particular thing in this phase only it all depends yes sir and many times you might have seen that depending on uh, depending on a project what people are doing is they are just trying to automate everything for example if the same data is coming again and again why to write on the code uh, same code again and again for if the data is same Go and just automate the thing. It will just save the time. That's what do. That's what we do in the end. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now you can see seven nine nine out of eight hundred. So it it will be eight hundred very soon. Then we will be able to see the result. Yeah. So meanwhile, if any question, please ask the question. Hello, sir. Mm -hmm. Sir, I just want to ask that for data fusion, which technique is to be used? Data fusion means what? What do you want to do actually? Uh, I want to fuse the data for from different domain, and then okay. I want to 
give it as input to the model. So you are saying that you wanna you want to give the data at one place. What you sir? Want to, you want to inject the data. You want to import the data at one place. That's what I'm. That's what you are saying. Uh, no you sir. Ah. Sir, suppose I have two different operations. Okay. Okay, and I have taken uh, one set from the one operation, and I have taken the another set from second operation, mm -hmm. and so I have now two data sets, and I want to fuse them. Okay, so uh, and then the next procedure procedure will be the same, the feature extraction and all that. So I want my model should be able to. Uh, classify first the process and then uh, the sub classification will be the uh, whatever the faults means if i say the first operation is of drilling and the second operation is of milling then my mm -hmm. uh, my model should be able to first classify the process that it should be drilling or either it is drilling or milling then in drilling which kind of uh, then the tool is healthy or faulty if it is in, if it is the process is milling the tool is healthy or faulty as yes. so so see madam, what like. you can do is what, that's what actually we also follow what you can do is you can go with uh, some unclustered uh, unsupervised uh, learning approaches you can go and you can try to divide your data set whatever the data set you have right you have these two sets different different sets right that's what you are saying yes you have two different yeah yeah now what you can do is you can go and you can apply for example machine learning algorithms on this data set separately on this data set whatever is the best choose that one whatever is the best here choose that so the, so that if new data comes what will happen that data will go to the corresponding cluster and corresponding good model will be applied to that data and you are going to get the result this is what you can do is it is it clear madam i am saying that two separate sets you apply different different algorithms separately and then get the best model so for to get the best model you you have something called as roc eoc receiver operator characteristics and area under the curve score again this is related to machine learning okay so my point is even though if you are having separate separate data set no problem madam You can. You would already have. You can take it them as a different different clusters or different different groups, and then apply algorithms separately on. So instead of one model, you are going to get two models. Sir, please can you repeat the ROC? What you have uh, yeah, just ROC, told now? Yeah, ROC. ROC is huh? receiver operator characteristic. Receiver operator characteristics. Yes, yes, characteristics. And okay, and the A second AUC, one. A U C is area under the curve. Okay. So, actually, what happens is there is one metric called as R O C underscore A U C underscore score. Again, this is present in Scikit Learn package. What it is going to, where it is going to help you is, if you are applying multiple algorithms on the same data set, it is going to help you to identify which which algorithm has given the best results. Same thing you can apply. If you remember uh, yesterday's session, I think I have talked about this one, but not in detail. But yes, you can make use of this kind of thing in your session. Is it clear, madam? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. So all of you, you can see that the number of steps eight hundred out of eight hundred. That means our model is successfully trained, right? Now, finally, what we got here is, if you want to check, the final accuracy is ninety-one percent, and the loss is ninety, right? So what I will do is, as I have already shown you, FDP dot JPG image. This is what this is the image of a dog. That means I should get the output the output as a dog only if I run this one. Right? Now see, I got the output as well. Or if I go and if I to predict it, again it's a dog. So the image which I have already shown you, right? It was a dog. And our model has successfully uh, identified the correct output as expected. Output, right. So this is one example of uh, CNN. One more is remaining actually. Uh, that is about COVID-19. What I will do is I will when when I will share the documents, <clears throat> I will be sharing one code. This one. This is the code for 
uh, CNN model for COVID-19, that is that X-ray image. Right? So once you people get it, you just need to go and run it. Obviously, what is what is the requirement for this? TensorFlow should be properly installed. How to install it? I have already shown you, right? The same code I'll be sharing. Everything is actually shown here with the code as well as the output. So I'll be sharing this source code with all of you and see how to save the model and all this. So remember, whenever it's some deep learning, we save the model with dot extra. And whenever it's a machine learning, uh, yesterday we have seen that we save the models with uh, dot pickle or uh, dot sa right? So I, I will hope that you people will go and will, will execute this particular code or those experiments. Exactly the same thing, whatever we had done for the risk cancer data. I hope everyone has understood whatever I have discussed here. So, yes, madam. Uh, okay, any, any, any question? If anyone, someone is having any question, you can ask, otherwise, I think it's time. Hello, if anyone has a question, please raise the question. You can directly put into chat window also if you have any question. I think. Uh, please share code, sir. So one of the participants is asking for code. Yes, sir. I will. I will share it with Madam. Okay. Okay. And no issue. Yeah. 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 Uh, if it is possible, sir, uh, can you share the uh, last session PPT that we had? Uh, which one, sir? No. That happened the day before yesterday. Oh, uh, okay, I did not. Uh, there was no PPT actually. So okay, 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 okay. Code was there. Okay. I... Uh, yes. So I will be sharing uh, yesterday's document and codes and today's documents. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so we will uh, we will share same with the participant. I will, yes, yes, I will mail it to Madam. Okay, no issue. Yeah. I think participants have done with their question. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, all the okay. Very yeah, nice. Interactive session. Yeah, there is actually some time limit also, so we just need to <laughs> bind everything within that time. Yes. Yes. Sure, sure, madam. Yeah, uh, sir. Uh, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, I am Prabodh Nimat, on behalf of Department of Computer Engineering. Thanks to uh, Yogesh sir for sparing time for a very informative session. And I hope all participants learned and enjoyed a lot. Uh, your hands-on session on the simple neural network and the conventional neural network on Jupiter was very informative. Uh, you know, it was very curious. I was very much curious for it. I uh, wanted to do the practical on it. Uh, and thank you all. Sure, people can do it, but that yeah. was not possible in that time frame, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you all participants uh, for making this session successful and very interactive by your contribution. So uh, hereby I declare session is over. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. And thank you all the participants. Okay. I think uh, I can leave, madam, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, madam. I will mail it to you as a deep part. Thank you.